In this video, I want to speak about the motivation behind Bayesian posterior sampling and also explain some of the intuition behind the concept. Firstly, starting off with the motivation, the goal of Bayesian inference in general is to gain insight into the posterior distribution over the sort of unknown parameters within the model. And we've spoken about the difficulty behind this and that mainly being due to the denominator. And we spoke about the fact that the denominator is in general quite difficult because of the fact that if you have a large number of parameters, then essentially you end up having to do some sort of difficult multidimensional integral, which in principle means that for the vast majority of cases, it's not going to be possible to analytically derive the distribution which is given by the posterior. So in general, that's not going to be possible. The only exception for that is if we have a prior and a likelihood which are what we call conjugate distributions. So in general, this isn't going to be possible. So what can we do? Well, it turns out that we may not need to exactly know the specific form of the posterior distribution, but what we can sort of get away with knowing are perhaps summary measures of that distribution. So if we were to know the mean, perhaps the variance, and you know perhaps any other me measure of or summary of that distribution, then that might be sufficient for us to go ahead and do Bayesian inference and Bayesian prediction. Luckily, it turns out that even if we cannot actually construct analytically the posterior distribution, it is possible to construct methods which nonetheless do exactly sample from the posterior distribution. And we're going to talk about exactly what we mean by the words exactly and sample uh, in the context of a posterior distribution and we're going to sort of introduce these two concepts or, or the concept of sampling rather via two particular examples. So the first example which I want to talk about here is the case of where you have a die. So let's say I've got a die and just to stress this is you know this is just sort of ordinary statistics here I'm not really thinking in Bayesian terms at all and if you don't know what a die is, a die is just a sort of cube which has got written on its various sides, the numbers 1 through 6. And let's say beforehand, before we actually throw the die, we have no idea as to what the probability is of obtaining any particular number. So how could we actually gain some insight into what the probability of obtaining each of those numbers is? Well, it's pretty intuitive, right? We could just throw the die. In other words, we could sort of take a sample from that particular distribution, which is represented by throwing the die. And if we were to throw the die a large number of times, then what we might obtain is some sort of frequency distribution across all the potential numbers which could come up on the die. So that's the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And if the die was relatively fair, then we might expect that the sort of frequency of each of these particular throws would be roughly the same. It won't be exactly the same because of the fact that essentially, you know, we haven't got an infinite sample here. But at least by throwing the die a number of times, in other words, sampling from the distribution which is represented by the sort of throwing of the die, we could gain insight in this case into what the particular probability mass function looks like for this case of a discrete random variable. So we can actually gain insight into the particular shape of this distribution. But perhaps we don't even need the shape. Perhaps what we might be interested in is, you know, what's the mean number which comes up on the die? And we might expect if it was a fair die that that would be roughly three and a half. And we might be interested in, let's say, another moment of that distribution. So we might be interested in what is the variance of throwing a die. And we could estimate both of these quantities via our sample. So notice what we've done here. We've taken a sample from the distribution which is representing the sort of throwing of this die and we're using summaries from those samples or summary statistics from those samples to represent the underlying distribution. And that's exactly the same in the case of the posterior distribution. If there are methods which allow us, and the keyword here is, to exactly sample from the posterior distribution, then in that circumstance, if we were to sort of look at some of the sort of sample measures, for example, the sample mean and the sample variance, then they will give us at least an approximate handle of what the corresponding quantities are of the posterior distribution. So that will allow us to have some insight into what the posterior distribution looks like. And in a lot of cases, that's sufficient enough to do Bayesian inference. 
The other example I want to talk about here is the case of a continuous random variable. So let's imagine that we have the case of the UK population. And what we're interested in, in finding out is, let's say we're actually interested in knowing what is the distribution of heights within the UK population. So again, in general, we don't have you know, the entirety of the UK population's height data. So what we need to do is we need to take some sort of perhaps a random sample. So if we took that random sample, what we might then do is we might then calculate some sort of measures of you know, the average height in that sample, the sample mean, and the sample standard deviation, which I'm going to call here sigma hat squared. And we might like to think that those two quantities, x bar and sigma hat squares, might in some way be indicative of what the underlying population distribution looks like. And also, again, if we were to sort of, you know, take a very relatively large sample here, we could also gain insight into what the shape of the distribution is. If we were to plot the frequency of all the different values of height which we obtained, we might get something which is, you know, perhaps looks roughly normally distributed. And that, in this case, would be perhaps indicative of what the underlying population distribution looks like. And again, notice that what we've done here is we've taken a sample and we've used those sample measures to make some sort of extrapolation about what the underlying distribution looks like. And that's exactly the same with the posterior distribution. If we can exactly sample from it, then in that case, we can perhaps make some inferences about, let's say, you know, what is the posterior mean value of theta and what is the po uh, posterior variance of theta. And in theory, if we know sufficient summaries of our data, that should then be sufficient then to go ahead and do Bayesian inference and prediction. So to summarize, sampling from the posterior distribution essentially, if we can do it exactly, provides quite a nice window into describing what the posterior distribution actually looks like. And although the method doesn't exactly tell us what the posterior distribution looks like, the window might be sufficiently large that we gain enough information as to know at least sufficient information about the posterior to allow us then to go ahead and to do Bayesian inference and prediction.